So for today, uh, I would like obviously to introduce my wonderful, esteemed, and really great friend, Dr. Gabriele Finaldi. Uh, please, Gabriele, thank you so much for being here. Dr. Gabriele Finaldi has been the director of the National Gallery since August of 2015. He was previously the deputy director for collections and research at the Museo Nacional del Prado, Madrid, position that he took in 2002. And I have to share with all of you that Gabriele and I met in 2003 because he is an expert in many things, but his dissertation for the doctorate grade at the Curto was on Rivera. Nobody else but El Españoleto and Gabriele and I had a pleasure of organizing together an exhibition in Mexico City in 2003. And of course, Gabriele, I cannot forget that also, that great lecture. And he was at the time curator at the National Gallery in London. And, and he reminded me yesterday that this is the second time that he is giving a lecture at this auditorium. Anybody was here in 1996 and listened to his talk? It could be possible. It could be possible. Hey, believe me, we have real loyalty here. <laughs> I've witnessed that. And uh, Gabriele was, was talking about on Velasquez. At the time, he was a curator. But if I am not wrong, this is the first time we have the director of the National Gallery in San Diego. So let's welcome the director of the National Gallery. Good morning, everyone. Um, what a pleasure to be with you. Uh, thank you, Roxana, for um, such a generous introduction. You're very sweet and you're very kind. And uh, it's nice to remember a long history uh, together. So thank you for that. And uh, congratulations on the fantastic things that are happening in the museum. I was here uh, 23 years ago. Uh, clearly, my talk was completely non-memorable. Um, <laughs> None of you has a clue what this guy was talking about 23 years ago, if you were here. Um, which bodes well for my wife, because she's not got used to the time change. She's counting on me to ensure that she gets some sleep during the lecture. So, <laughs> um, so Roxana, congratulations on, on, uh, on what's going on at the museum. It looks absolutely fantastic, and the show's great. So congratulations to, to Michael, too, and the team. It's really very, very impressive, and I'm delighted that, as the National Gallery, uh, we were able to contribute with some with some fine loans uh, as well. And um, greetings to all. Um, greetings to all the speakers who are going to be uh, speaking on uh, Saturday. It's very distinguished people in the audience. Thank you very much for for coming along. Um, <clears throat> I was um, reading the BBC website last night because I couldn't sleep, and um, and uh, there was an item on Freddie Mercury, the the rock singer, um, and he'd been offered a part in a musical called Time about 30 years ago. And he was asked to do two weeks performing in this musical. And he said, um, I couldn't possibly do it. Um, couldn't possibly do it, because I didn't get up till 3 o'clock in the afternoon anyway. So I couldn't do the matinees. And anyway, my, when, when I do a concert, I sing my heart out. Didn't use those words exactly. I sing my heart out. And I can't do anything for another few weeks. So um, that was the end of it. I've always wanted to be a rock star um, and get up at 3 in the afternoon. but. Uh, <coughs> Um, you start things really early here, so I'm very, I'm very impressed. Anyway, um, <clears throat> right, this is what I'm going to uh, talk about. So um, really, I'm going to focus on uh, the National Gallery's own collection. I had the honor of being the curator of the Spanish collection in the 1990s uh, before I went off to uh, Spain. And it is a very, very fine collection. It's a small collection. The National Gallery, indeed, is a small collection. You may not think so, but it is a small collection compared to the great collections of Europe and indeed America, um, you know, compared to the Louvre and the, and the Prado and the Berlin Museums and so on. It's, it's quite a small collection, and the Spanish collection is a small part of the small National Gallery collection, but it's very exquisite and very important. Now, uh, all of you, I'm sure, know uh, Trafalgar Square. You won't know where I live in London, which is a place called Catford in southeast London. But it, funnily enough, after the years that I've spent in Spain, I spent 13 years working in, in Madrid, uh, all of a sudden doing that journey into uh, work every morning, 
I was struck by the sheer number of reminders of Spain um, as I walk into the office. So this is the station where I have arrive every morning. It's called Charing Cross. It's just next door to Trafalgar Square. And as I walk out of uh, Charing Cross, that's not me on the left, by the way. Um, as I walk out of Charing Cross Station, um, I see this uh, Gothic structure here. This is one of the uh, crosses that were erected by uh, Edward I following the death of his beloved wife, Eleanor of Castile, at the very end of the 13th century. This is obviously a 19th century uh, recreation of it. But it's a monument that celebrates the uh, happy union between an English king and a Spanish princess. In fact, the very first thing I see when I step out of Charing Cross Station and start walking to Trafalgar Square, where my office is, uh, is the combination of those two shields, Castilla y León on the left and uh, the three lions of England on the right. Uh, then, of course, I, I reach um, the, the, the place where I work, which is familiar to you, which, of course, is based uh, in Trafalgar Square, in the very heart of London, in the, ga the very gangway of London, as our 19th century predecessors used to say. Um, this, of course, is Trafalgar Square. And as, of course, many of you will know, Trafalgar is a place in Spain. It's where the battle uh, took place in 1805 between the combined uh, French and British fleets against the uh, Spanish fleet, um, commanded by Nelson. And Nelson, of course, sits on top of the, uh, of the column. So the reminders are there from the very moment I get off uh, the train and I walk across the North Terrace of Trafalgar Square and walk into my office, which is just here. And as I uh, open the door to the office uh, entrance, uh, right above the door is a bust of this man here, the Duke of Wellington. Not this one. I couldn't find a photo uh, of the one I wanted to show you. But anyway, it's rather like this. Uh, the Duke of Wellington, of course, was the commander of the Allied forces in Spain uh, during the Peninsular War. And it's he who really is the first significant collector in Britain, um, by accident, actually, of uh, Spanish painting. Because uh, at the Battle of Vittoria in 1813, he captured the baggage train of Joseph Bonaparte, who was fleeing uh, towards the French frontier, and had taken with him a whole group of pictures and works of art from the royal palaces in Madrid. So the baggage train was captured. Uh, it was sent on to England. And Wellington was informed that inside the baggage train were all kinds of artistic treasures. He felt slightly embarrassed about it and offered to return them to Fernando VII, the recently restored Spanish king. Uh, but the king, in his bounty and in his gratitude, frankly, uh, said, look, Let's say no more about it. You just keep them. And among them, of course, was a work which is as great as the picture that you see on the left, the water cellar of Seville, um, a picture from uh, Velazquez's early years in Seville, a picture that he brought to court and was much admired when it was in the royal collection. And that's one of the pictures that ended up, there's a group of uh, more than 200 works that ended up in Wellington's own uh, collection. When Wellington was in uh, Madrid in 1813, when he arrived in Madrid, um, he wanted to be painted by the uh, principal painter in the city. Uh, that was, of course, uh, Goya. So Goya, who very skillfully navigated the changing uh, position of the government in Madrid and the changing alliances, was working both for the French, but then was working for the English, and then worked for the restored monarchy as well. He had to make a living. Uh, he had to look after his family and so on. Anyway, he paints this portrait of Wellington on horseback, probably not his most distinguished portrait, and Wellington, I don't think, was particularly thrilled by it. And for many years, it was just rolled up and put in an attic. Uh, it was eventually unrolled uh, probably about 20 or 30 years ago and, uh, and uh, put on display. It's rather damaged, as you can tell, even from a photograph. Uh, interestingly, in an X-ray, uh, it looks as if uh, underneath uh, this portrait there might have been uh, a portrait of Joseph Bonaparte himself. <laughs> but this, uh, this, was the, this was the first significant, really significant collection of Spanish painting in uh, London. And the National Gallery at this stage had not yet even been uh, established because the National Gallery uh, doesn't uh, get going until 1824. But there is a Wellington connection that will bring us into the National Gallery, and that's this picture here. Uh, once Wellington was back in England, his brother, who was called Henry Wellesley, who was the um, plenipotentiary uh, 
uh, ambassador in Madrid, uh, received this painting as a gift from Fernando VII. So Fernando had been uh, generous both to uh, the Duke of Wellington and to his brother. And this picture eventually ended up in the National Gallery in the 1840s and is the first painting by Velazquez to enter the National Gallery. The National Gallery has a very significant group of paintings by Velazquez, uh, more than any other collection after the Prado, of course. And it's a rather fascinating painting because it's a landscape by uh, Velazquez. We don't really associate um, Velazquez with uh, landscape paintings, but this is a large landscape showing a uh, hunt at the court of Philip IV. It's set um, probably in a place called El Hoyo de Manzanares, which is in the hills of the Prado to the north of Madrid, which was a favored hunting site for the king and his court. And he was a very, very passionate uh, huntsman. You can just about see him here. Uh, that's the king. Uh, he's fighting a boar here and accompanied by his prime minister, the Count Duke of Olivares. Uh, this is almost certainly his uh, brother, the Infante uh, Don Carlos. And the queen, Isabel de Borbon, uh, sits in one of the uh, carriages. It's a picture which is, has been known from a very early date as the Tela Real, uh, the royal enclosure, not because it's a royal canvas, the painting itself, but because this is the royal enclosure uh, made with uh, canvas sheets into which the animals were driven so that the king and his closest courtiers could fight them and demonstrate uh, their bravery and enjoy the hunt. That's what they liked doing. But as with Velasquez, the, uh, as with many works uh, by Velasquez, his approach is, is, is very, very uh, original. It's particularly striking in this picture, which is a royal painting, so it's celebrating uh, the king as a huntsman, his courage, uh, his horsemanship, and so on. Uh, what he's placed in the foreground and what he devotes a lot of energy and attention to uh, are these foreground figures, which are a mixture of uh, courtiers, of priests, of nobles, of uh, servants, of dog handlers, of beggars, and so on. Uh, Velasquez is constantly kind of fascinated with the uh, variety of life sort of on the edges of the court. So um, that's got us uh, into the National Gallery uh, from Charing Cross Station via uh, Wellington's collection and uh, into uh, the building uh, on the square. I'm going to focus essentially on the four principal artists who we associate uh, with the Golden Age of Spain. Uh, golden Age, of course, is a, a rather loose uh, term. It sort of covers the um, second half of the 16th century, right to possibly the beginning of the uh, 18th century. It's a useful, uh, it's a useful hanger on which, to, uh, on which to kind of base uh, discussions of art in this uh, period. I noticed that in your exhibition, it's a concept that's being uh, questioned, as indeed it should be. Uh, but it is a useful uh, concept to think about and indeed to challenge. Um, El Greco, of course, as you know, has this um, complex background, having been born uh, in, in a Venetian dominion in Crete, having been trained as a medieval icon painter, then having transferred himself to Venice and subsequently to Rome, but looks to Spain to develop his career in a way which he simply hadn't had the opportunity of doing in uh, in Italy. So he arrives in uh, Spain, and around the time he arrives, possibly just before or immediately afterwards, uh, he paints this composition, of which this is a reduced version. You know that El Greco had this uh, uh, tendency to uh, paint his large pictures. Uh, he would sometimes paint sketches in preparation for them, but he would also paint replicas on a reduced scale. Um, and a visitor to his studio towards the end of his life, um, Francisco Pacheco, who writes about his visit, he turns out to uh, later be the uh, father-in-law of Velasquez. He says that um, El Greco showed him uh, that uh, he opened a cupboard and showed him a whole series of small pictures uh, relating to his bigger composition. So he seems to have produced these small pictures, of which this would be one of them. This is a small picture, no bigger than that, um, but uh, uh, replicating. Uh, a larger composition that he made for the king. And it's a fascinating picture. It's complex in its iconography. Um, and it shows uh, what, uh, what uh, was known already in the 16th century as the, the Holy League, which was the, uh, the, the, the alliance between uh, the Catholic Spain, between the uh, 
uh, Republic of Venice and the papacy uh, to fight uh, a crusade in the Eastern Mediterranean. So you'll see here uh, Philip II himself, um, the Pope, and the Doge of Venice surrounded by uh, various apostles, uh, angels up in the sky, and then here this huge dog's mouth, which is the entrance to hell or the underworld, and you'll see all these figures uh, kneeling here. So uh, kneeling before the name of Jesus, of course, as the uh, epistle, St. Paul's epistle says. There's the IHS of Jesus' name. So it's a, a rendition of this uh, scene, as it were, at the end of time, an eschatological rendition of the adoration of the name of Jesus, but combined with a very specific uh, historical moment. And El Greco has this remarkable ability to synthesize these complex uh, subjects and give them a very, very powerful, uh, distinctive uh, rendition. And that's what El Greco was so admired for. Um, he was possibly a little bit kind of far out for the Italians who always prefer uh, something which is more measured, more symmetrical, more classicizing and so on. But in Spain, he found a ready audience, particularly in Toledo, uh, where he spent the rest of his life. And it's in Toledo that he painted uh, this picture here, uh, a late rendition of a subject that he painted several times over the course of his uh, career, uh, and which you can almost use as a sort of touchstone for the various uh, phases of El Greco's career, beginning in Venice, through on to Rome, and then uh, on to Spain. Uh, you can see the, uh, the acid colors, you can see the flailing uh, limbs on the left side of the composition. You can see the elongated figures, all the features of El Greco's very distinctive manner, his distinctive style are present here. But once again, as in the painting we saw just a moment ago, mm -hmm. the sort of complexity of the interpretation of the, uh, of the biblical subject matter. So it's Christ uh, cleansing the temple. The traders are here on the left. Here are the apostles and Christ's followers who are looking at him and debating what it is that he's doing, looking for a meaning to uh, this uh, violent action in the temple. And then up here, uh, the two reliefs that's, that are indicating the kind of interpretation that no doubt uh, they are considering, the expulsion of Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden, uh, the expulsion of the traders. You can see the connection there very clearly. And over here, uh, the sacrifice of uh, Isaac, uh, this is uh, an episode, of course, in his public ministry, which will eventually lead to uh, Christ's own crucifixion. So um, uh, an artist who's very attuned to uh, theological thinking, uh, very attuned to the concerns of the church in uh, Spain, and also very skillful in giving those a very, very distinctive uh, and recognizable uh, uh, appearance. So Greco is um, <clears throat> sort of at the beginning of the uh, golden age, I guess. And then we get into the, uh, the full 17th century, um, the century which is so powerful in great individual artists uh, associated with, um, with, with Spanish art history. Um, and I'm going to begin with, uh, with Zorbaran, who, as you know, comes from Extremadura, establishes himself in Seville, uh, where he develops his career and eventually passes his last years in uh, Madrid. Uh, you've got a fantastic group of uh, Zorbarans in the exhibition. Uh, you've got a sort of little chapel uh, devoted to uh, Zorbaran, which is beautifully laid out. There's a fabulous selection of paintings there. Um, I noticed that you recently uh, cleaned the, um, the Virgin Child of St. John the Baptist. It's looking absolutely marvelous. I did say to... Um, I did say to, to uh, Roxana that uh, I, I hope at some point we'll be able to show that in London. We'd be very honored to be able to do that. But you, in the meantime, are showing uh, this picture here, which comes from the National Gallery. Um, you're not actually seeing it like that because it's been especially restored for your exhibition. So that's an old slide. I couldn't actually find a, 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 a picture that, that shows it as, it as it appears now. But it's even more extraordinary um, than what you see there. Uh, what I did want to highlight here is that this is a picture that comes to the National Gallery in 1853. Now, many of the Spanish pictures that end up in London uh, come via France. Uh, a few of them come directly from Spain, but a lot of them come via France. And this is one of the pictures that was a star of the collection formed by the French king, King Louis Philippe, who established a Spanish gallery in the Louvre. 
for uh, a couple of decades. Uh, when he was um, expelled from, uh, from France, when he lost the French throne, uh, his collection, which was a private collection, uh, was sold off in London at his death. Uh, and in 1853, uh, the National Gallery bought this picture directly at that sale in London. It was a very controversial uh, acquisition. Um, several of the, um, of the art historians associated with the National Gallery, um, particularly one called William Cunningham, who was a specialist in Italian painting, thought that this was nothing more than a nasty version of a Rembrandt. <laughs> so he thought this was not the kind of thing that the British public should be seeing in the National Gallery's rooms because it was not, uh, it was not instructive, uh, it was not educational, it was simply a bad example of uh, the way uh, Rembrandt was misinterpreted in southern Spain. Well, of course, we know different, uh, and we think different, and indeed, um, people thought differently even at the time. Uh, there's a famous correspondence in the pages of the Times around the time of the acquisition of this picture between uh, Richard Ford and uh, William Cunningham. Richard Ford was a great Hispanist, a great admirer, of uh, Spain and of Spanish art, saying that this is an extremely important, extremely representative, and very, very fine example of the work of uh, Zorbaran. So by this time, the collection is still very, very small. We've got the De La Real by Velázquez, and we've got our first uh, Zorbaran in the collection, but the Spanish collection is still very small. It's to be regretted that the trustees of the National Gallery at the time uh, didn't feel more confident to buy more pictures from the uh, Gallery Espanol sale held in London in 1853, because in fact many important pictures uh, came uh, from the Gallery Espanol, and many of those, of course, have gone on to nourish great collections around the world, including several uh, American collections. But another picture that was shortly to come into uh, the collection by Zorbran was this superb uh, example of St. Margaret of Antioch. Now, Zorbran, I think, Finds, uh, finds it very easy to work with these single figures where there's sort of an intense focus on uh, a, a, a single figure composition with these um, attributes, elements, uh, like the saddlebag she's carrying on her arm or the prayer book she has uh, in her hand, uh, these beautiful rendered uh, costumes. Uh, Zorbran, unlike El Greco, doesn't have the same sort of Italian training, the... Uh, the, the, the tradition of building up a large composition, a big narrative composition, and, and his, certainly his works are of this kind, are enormously uh, admired. Uh, Sir Margaret h appears here as a, uh, as a shepherdess. Uh, she's also the uh, patron of um, expectant mothers. Um, she was swallowed by a dragon and prayed to God and exploded from the dragon's belly. Now, if that gives you consolation, uh, as you're expecting. Well, there we are. Um, <laughs> but uh, she, 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 she's, uh, she is the patron saint of expectant mothers. Um, more recently, the National Gallery acquired this work here, which actually came from the collection of Kenneth Clark, who had been the directors of the National Gallery in the 1930s and in the, uh, uh, the, the war years up until 46. Um, he wasn't particularly interested in Spanish uh, art. Um, many of you will know Civilization, the television series he made at the end of the 1960s, and the book that has accompanied it that um, still makes very, very fascinating reading. He famously says in the introduction there that he didn't think that Spain had made a really significant contribution to European civilization. You can imagine the Spaniards were thrilled by that. <laughs> But he did actually uh, collect uh, a small group of Spanish pictures, and amongst them was this very, very beautiful uh, Zorbran still life. It's a fragment. We don't know what it's a fragment of. Um, one of the sides, I think it's the right side, uh, is original, but it's been cut around the other three edges. So potentially it could be a fragment from a larger still life. It could even be a fragment from a larger um, figural composition. We're, we're simply not sure. It's beautifully uh, executed. You can see the reflections on the, uh, on the silver plate. Uh, you can see the way he handles the reflections in the uh, water, the transparency of the water in the uh, ceramic cup, um, the delicacy of the execution of the rose on the left. Um, he, here is an artist who is um, extraordinarily skillful in the rendition of texture, in uh, creating images which are mysterious and uh, memorable.
um, there's almost an inevitable tendency to want to give these works an interpretation, uh, particularly uh, a religious interpretation. It would seem somehow to fit in uh, with the way uh, Spaniards of the 17th century would have thought about uh, pictures of this kind. Um, the transparency of the water suggesting the purity of the Virgin Mary, the rose associated with um, the Virgin Mary as one of her titles is Rosa Mystica, and so on. And then, of course, when one looks at Zorbrand's own oeuvre to see if that can help with the interpretation, uh, we do find, uh, for example, in this early work from the late 1620s, uh, of the uh, Virgin Mary curing the blessed Reginald of Orléans. I know you're all familiar with that story. Um, and here on the table is this uh, still life element of uh, the cup of water with a, with a rose, um, which uh, suggests uh, some connection, I suppose, uh, with the Virgin Mary, although I guess you could also say that would be most suitable for somebody who's in his uh, sick bed. Um, but also, you see that element appearing in the very beautiful um, picture, which you all know, which is a Californian uh, uh, Zorboran. Uh, and uh, here, too, interestingly, the interpretation which has been given to this picture here um, has been in uh, the line of seeing this as a sort of religious homage uh, to the Virgin. Uh, famously, Roberto Longhi, the Italian uh, art historian who first wrote about this picture, uh, describes the objects being laid out uh, like gifts on uh, an altar table. And, of course, Sorbaran's uh, works are principally uh, religious in subject. His uh, activity was principally, of course, for uh, religious foundations, uh, for churches, for uh, monasteries, um, for nunneries and so on, which were, of course, uh, growing in the first half of the 17th century in uh, Seville as part of this remarkable development of the city in the Golden Age. Um, his son, uh, Juan Zorboran, we don't know very much about. Um, he had a son who was born in uh, 1620 um, and died in 1649, so he lived a very short life. And about a dozen works are attributed to him, uh, none of them uh, subject pictures, all of them, uh, all of them uh, uh, um, uh, still life paintings. And uh, this one here is a recent acquisition of the National Galleries. It was bought uh, just about two years ago. Uh, you can see that there's a sort of genetic relationship with the works that uh, Francisco, his father, painted. I suppose there's a slightly more kind of expansive uh, attitude in Juan's painting. Uh, the pictures are uh, bigger. Um, the presentation is perhaps a little bit more decorative. Um, and you can see this, this large basket of, uh, of, of enormous lemons sort of overflowing uh, with the, uh, you know, the, the generosity uh, of nature. Uh, you also have an element here which is rather similar to the one that we've just uh, seen with a Chinese cup, a Chinese cup of the kind that we uh, have examples of uh, in Madrid in the Museo Naval, for example, absolutely identical to these. Uh, imported into Spain in the 1630s and 40s uh, on, a, on a, a, silver, a silver plate and a goldfinch, of course, over here. The goldfinch is usually associated with the passion as well, although it's more difficult to see that there's a, a, such an easy religious reading uh, in the works of Juan as there are in the works of his father. It's a very grand uh, picture, beautifully preserved, and I'm delighted the gallery was able to uh, acquire it just a short while ago. But that brings us on to uh, this fascination for real objects, for the rendition of textures and surfaces, for a sort of earthiness that we tend to associate with uh, Spanish Golden Age painting. And that's demonstrated very, very effectively in uh, this painting here by Diego Velazquez. Now, this picture is, um, interestingly, uh, when back in 1995, the National Gallery did an exhibition on Spanish still life painting, uh, your very beautiful Sanchez Cotan uh, was lent to us. It was lent to us on the understanding that we would lend this Velasquez in return. I'm not quite sure why it didn't happen. Uh, you got me to come and lecture instead in 1996. <laughs> Poor second or third or fourth, uh, I would say. But uh, here it is in uh, reproduction. And of course, uh, I hope we've made up a little bit for it with the, the loans that we've made to the exhibition. But um, Diego Velasquez, as, uh, as a young man in his late teens here, doing something very inventive uh, 
uh, combining a scene from uh, contemporary everyday life uh, with a, a fabulous element of uh, still life there on the right-hand side. Uh, these ladies are uh, preparing a, a meal. They're preparing some sort of ali uh, sauce here that will go uh, with the beautiful fish that you can see there. But interesting, of course, uh, through this hatch is uh, a, a biblical scene, uh, the gospel scene of Christ uh, addressing Martha and Mary. Now, he didn't invent this subject, and I'm showing you a, an earlier example of this sort of treatment of the subject uh, where the religious scene is in the background and it's the sort of kitchen element, the sort of contemporary genre element uh, that is of principal interest to the artist. In this case, um, uh, an artist called uh, Joachim Bacalar, who's working in the Netherlands in the, uh, the mid-16th century. Uh, and you can see this, this idea of placing the main story in the background and making this the prime uh, focus for the viewer. And you can put those side by side. I'm not suggesting that this was a picture that uh, Velasquez knew, but he would have known uh, pictures of this kind. But he gives it a very personal uh, interpretation. And he's clearly wanting us to make some sort of link. It's not easy to understand exactly what he wants us to think. Uh, between the story in the foreground, where there seems to be an old lady who's chiding a younger, uh, rather grumpy-looking servant, uh, and this scene here where you'll recall from the gospel narrative that Christ uh, is, is favoring uh, Mary, who sits at his feet listening to him, rather than Martha, who's been preparing uh, the meal. There's been a long debate in the literature, slightly tedious, I have to say, about whether this is a frame, whether it's a picture... Uh, whether it's a hatch. When the picture was cleaned at the National Gallery, it became, I think, very apparent that we are looking at a, at a hatch. If you look at the perspective lines here, it's slightly wider on the right than it is on the left. It's not a frame. It's not the frame of a picture. It's not the frame of a mirror. I think quite clearly you are looking at a, at a hatch. And that would fall in with the kind of um, precedence that Velasquez would have, uh, would have known. But Velasquez, as a young man, doing a very sort of intelligent take on this tradition of uh, northern uh, uh, um, genre combined with religious subjects. Um, <clears throat> we also have in the National Gallery uh, Velasquez's um, early Immaculate Conception. Um, he, he latches on to this subject very early on. We all think of Murillo's Immaculate Conceptions. We'll see one or two of those in a moment. But uh, Velasquez is there right from the start when uh, in Seville it becomes a subject of uh, veneration, a subject that was keenly and deeply felt within the religious communities in the city. And he's already sort of conceiving how uh, the Immaculate Conception will be uh, represented. So she's shown here as a very uh, young woman uh, with the imagery of the woman of the uh, apocalypse with the stars around her head. But it is, once again, a very real rendition. She's not idealized. She's a young uh, girl, possibly somebody in the family, uh, but a model who would have been close uh, to hand. And it's that model who becomes, in the hands of Velasquez, uh, the Virgin Mary herself. Um, a few years ago, uh, this picture was uh, identified uh, on the market and was acquired for the uh, Fundación Focus in uh, Seville. My very good friend, uh, Benito Navarrete, here played a part in the acquisition of uh, this picture. It was a very, very interesting question. People are kind of reluctant to see new works coming into the canon of an artist who's as important, as significant as Velasquez. But it was the comparison with the National Gallery picture that I think made it very clear that here we were looking at a work which was possibly just, just executed, just, just before uh, the National Gallery's uh, own picture. Several of the elements that you see in the National Gallery picture are here too. And uh, particularly, once again, I think you have that, very ren that rendition of a very specific head uh, standing for uh, that of the uh, Virgin Mary. And here, down at the bottom of the National Gallery pictures, sort of integrated into uh, the landscape, this is already the second Velasquez landscape I'm showing you, um, which, which are elements taken from uh, the Litanies, which refer to the Virgin Mary as the Fountain of Grace, uh, or the Temple of the Holy Spirit, or the Bark of Salvation, the Ship of Salvation. Uh, he integrates into this kind of unified uh, landscape, and it's sort of setting the tone for how this subject will be represented uh, in the future. And it's a very kind of skillful rendition of a transparent moon uh, through which you're seeing uh, the landscape setting. Uh, 
Here, in a way, is a much more obvious uh, rendition by another artist who works in Seville, Juan de Valdez uh, Leal, where the same elements are present, uh, presented in a slightly more obvious, you could say in a slightly more pedestrian way, although the, show is, although the picture is very showy. Um, there's the Immaculate Conception herself. Um, here's the Throne of Grace. You can see that uh, the, the steps leading up to it. Uh, here's the, the unblemished mirror. Um, these are the kinds of elements that uh, are associated with the imagery of the Immaculate Conception. And here you have the donors, we don't know who they are, um, who are praying before an image or an apparition, uh, possibly before a painting. Um, and that's what you were supposed to do anyway. All these pictures were uh, produced in order to uh, deepen devotion and to um, attract uh, veneration. But Velasquez, of course, um, goes to court, and that's what transforms his career. Um, at court, he becomes a painter of portraits, particularly portraits of the king, members of the royal family, and high-ranking members of the court. Uh, but also, of course, he becomes a painter of uh, great subjects. And at the National Gallery, we have two significant portraits of uh, the king. You've got to remember that British collectors always loved portraits and so um, were very attracted to portraits from uh, Italy and from Spain and from the Netherlands. Um, this uh, is one of the finest uh, paintings by Velasquez of uh, Philip IV, who was the king whom he served uh, during his entire career, practically. They sort of grew old uh, together. Velasquez was a little bit older uh, than the king. And over the course of practically 40 years working for the king, he produced a series of uh, prototypes from the life, which were then repeated by him and by his collaborators to produce the royal images that were required by the court and which needed to be sent round to the embassies, to members of the family uh, who married into other royal families and so on. But uh, Velasquez's sort of originals, the kind of prototypes that he produces, are really very, very spectacular uh, pictures. And this is certainly uh, one of them, uh, probably painted immediately after Velasquez returned from his trip, first trip to Italy uh, in 1631-32. Uh, 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 and you can see the sort of brio of his brushwork in the execution of this sort of silver embroidery on this brown uh, coat and breeches. Um, this is such a particular uh, costume that we believe that it must be associated with some event. And we've tried hard looking at the descriptions of events at the court of Philip IV to try and associate the image with a particular event. Um, the closest we've come is the swearing of the oath of allegiance to his son, Baltasar Carlos, in 1631, when he's described as wearing a brown costume with gold embroidery. It's not quite what we see here, uh, but it does suggest that this is um, uh, probably associated with a particular uh, event at the court. Um, what Velasquez is doing is he's standing in front of the king. He's being received um, in a sort of um, audience uh, setting. And you can see that the king is holding a petition in his hand, which is inscribed with the word senor, sir, or lord, uh, the way you ad would address the king, and then uh, Pintor de Vuestra Majestad, painter to your majesty, Diego Velasquez, who, of course, um, signs his pictures very, very rarely, actually. So this is a rather special example. Here's a few of those prototypes uh, that Velasquez painted of the king. This one you know because, of course, it's in the show. It comes from the meadows. That's probably the first prototype that Velasquez paints of the young king, um, Philip IV was just 16 when he became uh, king, and that's painted a few years later. Interestingly, that head, as you see it there, appears underneath this one here in X-ray. Um, he made some modifications to it. He made it slightly more elongated, perhaps a little bit more handsome. He wasn't the most uh, handsome uh, king that Spain's ever had. Um, and then you can see that he repeats it. Um, so that's a practically identical head here. Um, and then you can see other uh, portraits of the king over the course of his career. But probably Velasquez painted no more than six or seven <laughs> prototypes uh, from the king uh, directly in sittings. And then uh, these were uh, reproduced both by him, here's an example, uh, and indeed by his collaborators. Now, the picture that the National Gallery has lent to your show is this one here, which seems to be a prototype related to this one. 
uh, but possibly just a few years later. You can see that he looks slightly older. His, he is, his sort of, he's a bit more jowly. Um, he, his eyes look a little bit more uh, tired. Um, his, his, um, his chin has become slightly sort of lower. Um, he famously, in one of his uh, correspondences with a nun, um, he had two nuns that he corresponded with at different times of his career, where he uh, talks quite intimately about his own life, about his family, about his concerns, about the empire, and so on. Uh, in one of these uh, correspondences, he talks about how he is reluctant to submit himself to the phlegm of Velasquez um, because he sees himself getting old. So as he looks at the portraits that Velasquez is making of him, and you can imagine he had that suite of portraits uh, before him in the royal palace, he had this clear sense that he was getting uh, older, that his skin was, uh, uh, was sagging, uh, that uh, the weight, uh, the burden of the empire of so many years of war, uh, of heavy mourning because of the uh, loss of uh, his children, of his first wife, and so on, weighed very, very heavily uh, on him. That's one of the very, very rare examples we have of uh, the king making an observation, a direct observation on painting, and a direct observation on uh, the work of Velasquez himself. But uh, Velasquez did also paint these uh, grander subject pictures. The opportunities were given to him at court. He was uh, intending, he was meant to paint for the king, but he also had the right to paint pictures for private patrons. He was allowed to do that. Um, and this is probably an example of that. We don't know the early history of this picture. Um, it's the rather surprising subject, or rare subject, let's say, of the uh, Christian soul uh, being directed by uh, this guardian angel to contemplate uh, the suffering Christ. It's a picture which has its own sort of stage directions in it. And so you and I, as we look at this picture, are being instructed about how we should behave in front of it. So we should be taking the same uh, position, even the same physical position, as this, uh, this uh, infant soul here in order to express our veneration and our gratitude uh, to the suffering Christ. It's a very uh, beautiful Italianate type nude, and I think Velasquez was always conscious that uh, Italian painting was a significant uh, reference for him, and indeed something that he wanted to uh, rival in his uh, artistic achievements as well. He traveled twice uh, to Italy, and I think this, uh, while it may not have been painted uh, after that first trip, nonetheless, there were many Italian pictures in the royal collection of which he was the sort of, um, the, the sort of curator, uh, or became the sort of curator, um, which were there as examples for him to look at. Um, this is where the subject comes from, or anyway, these sorts of devotional prints uh, from the 16th and 17th centuries, and you can see here there's a guardian angel uh, pointing out the coronation of the Virgin up in the heavens uh, with this Christian soul here, and the angel is protecting the soul from the mouth of hell and from this demon who's uh, threatening him with a, a, an arrow. But you can see that uh, Velasquez's rendition is rather better, rather more interesting, rather more subtle. Um, and he also has the opportunity to paint uh, mythological uh, subjects. Uh, this, of course, is probably Velasquez's most famous picture in the National Gallery's uh, collection, the Toilet of Venus, or the Rugby Venus, uh, because it comes from a house in northern England, in Teesdale, uh, called uh, Rugby Hall, or Rugby Hall, as they say up there. Um, and it's a picture that uh, was never in the royal collection, was made for... Uh, the Marquess of Carpio, who was a high-ranking uh, uh, aristocrat at the court of Charles uh, of Philip IV, and a great uh, and passionate collector of uh, painting. My colleague Marcus Burke here in row two knows everything you can possibly know about him. Um, and he was almost certainly the patron uh, of this work, and it's the kind of picture which we know he would have liked. He was that kind of guy. Um, <coughs> and, you know, this is the kind of painting that Spanish painters didn't really do and which certainly Velasquez didn't really do. So the circumstances for this commission must have been rather uh, special. Spanish uh, painters, generally speaking, didn't paint the nude. Uh, there is some literature uh, on uh, painting the nude. It's felt to be an inappropriate subject. It's a, a subject which is uh, morally problematic. It's a subject that can lead the painter and indeed the viewer into sin. 
and consequently it's not encouraged that Spanish painters should undertake uh, the nude. In those cases where it's absolutely necessary to paint the nude because you're doing Adam and Eve, for example, you can't really avoid uh, doing the nude if you're doing uh, Adam and Eve, then uh, you're, you're instructed to uh, follow the model of a print, not, uh, not a, a, a nude, not a, not a model who you will be place, who you'll place uh, in front of you. Um, but it's, uh, once again, I think Velasquez is, is wanting to take on uh, the Italian tradition, and the Italian tradition of the mythological nude is nowhere represented better than in the Spanish royal collection itself. Uh, for example, in uh, what, this picture of Danae by Titian, a, a picture from the uh, 1550s, that uh, is acquired by Velasquez himself, in 1630, when he is in Italy uh, to be given to, uh, the, uh, to, 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 to the king, acquired for the, for the king. So it was fine for the Italians. Uh, Spaniards didn't really do uh, nudes, but Velasquez wanted to take on the subject and demonstrate that he too could make a, a sort of sig significant uh, contribution in this area. Um, it's a picture which is, its early history is mysterious, but at a certain point in its history, we know that it was flanked by this picture here. These are two drawings made by um, a, a Scottish artist of no particular importance, but he was in Spain in the uh, late 18th century, Richard Cooper, and he uh, was able to see this picture uh, in uh, the collection in which it was uh, at that time, which was the collection of the... Um, of the, uh, uh, the, the Albas, and it was clearly flanked by this picture here, which is a Venetian-style nude, um, and the proposal that was made when these drawings were first published about uh, 30 years ago was that Velasquez had essentially uh, responded to this picture here. So this is a, a sort of nude in a landscape, uh, this is a nude in a bedroom, this is a nude seen from the front, this is a nude scene from uh, behind. And that sort of juxtaposition uh, certainly had its own uh, history in the Spanish royal collection. Um, when I was a curator in the mid-1990s, um, the picture was found in a private Belgian collection and was brought to the National Gallery, and we were able to hang it uh, side by side with the Velasquez itself. It's a miserable picture. It's a very poor quality. And so we were asked to consider whether we wanted to show it uh, with the Velasquez in the gallery. And we said, no, we certainly don't. Uh, we're very pleased to know of it, and we're pleased that it should be photographed and it should be documented and so on. Uh, but this is clearly an example, if indeed that's what it is, of a very mediocre picture uh, giving a rise to a great masterpieces, of which there are several examples that one can point to in the, in the history of art. But the really interesting thing is that these two pictures, at a certain point, when they were in the collection of uh, Manuel Godoy, who was the Prime Minister of Spain under Charles IV at the beginning of the, uh, of the uh, 19th century, um, was in a room together with Goya's Macha. So you have to imagine these four pictures together in a sort of erotic cabinet. Um, <laughs> And to the point where we, we don't know exactly what this looked like, but there was a tradition in uh, Spanish aristocratic collections and indeed in uh, the royal collection for uh, the erotic pictures to be sort of gathered together and usually placed under lock and key, sometimes placed behind a curtain um, so that the ladies of the court wouldn't have to look at these. And when the men were gathered, they could be uh, revealed. Uh, there is a sort of probably scurrilous account by a French visitor to uh, Godoy's palace who says that Godoy would invite in his, um, his drinking mates and he would uh, sort of turn a handle and he sort of, you know, a bit like Wizard of Oz, he'd disappear behind the, the curtain, turn a handle, and uh, Goya's uh, uh, clothed uh, macha would sort of, you know, go round on this mechanism and then disappear behind, behind the naked macha, which would be... Uh, revealed. So clearly there was, uh, 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 you know, there was an erotic intention in this grouping of uh, these pictures. It must have been very remarkable, um, as well as extraordinarily uh, titillating, uh, to, be, uh, to be in, uh, in this uh, setting with Goya's great uh, masterpieces of the, uh, the Machas, uh, together with the, the, the Ropey Venus uh, and the um, Pordenone stroke uh, Titianesque nude that we saw just uh, 
a moment ago. Now, um, the, <coughs> the Ropley Venus, of course, has its own tragic history at the National Gallery. Um, it was acquired as the most expensive Spanish picture ever bought by the National Gallery in 1906 for a sum of £45,000, which was um, a very, very large sum um, at that time. It was the first major uh, acquisition of the National Art Collections Fund, which uh, Michael knows uh, all about here in, in the front row since he worked with the uh, NACF in London years ago. Um, and the NACF still exists today. It's called the Art Fund. It's an organization that helps museums in Britain to buy uh, works of art. Um, it was very famous, of course, as uh, a rare nude subject by Velasquez. It was um, very admired. Uh, it was also famous for being such an expensive picture, which is why in 1914, in February, it became the object of uh, this famous suffragette uh, attack. Uh, Mary Richardson, uh, this lady here, uh, soon to be known as Slasher Mary, um, <laughs> entered the National Gallery and uh, uh, attacked uh, the painting um, in protest at the imprisonment of another very prominent uh, suffragette called Emmeline uh, Pankhurst. Um, she was um, apprehended, as you can see in this, uh, in this uh, sort of early uh, cartoon, uh, but the damage was done. She drew out a meat cleaver from her sleeve, uh, broke the glass on the picture, and uh, attacked it. This is a photograph taken at the time. It's a rather horrifying um, uh, image. Um, this, of course, has become part of the history of this picture, and I'd say that uh, today in many uh, art history faculties, um, it's this attack on the picture which is considered, in a way, far more important uh, than the picture uh, itself. But you know, these pictures sort of carry their history uh, with them, and while this was never something that Velasquez intended uh, to happen, it is something that's been uh, associated with that picture and, of course, contributed to a very kind of significant uh, discourse on uh, you know, how these pictures, uh, who these pictures are made for, what kind of viewing uh, they tend to uh, encourage, how they should be thought of. Uh, there's some very interesting uh, theoretical discussion uh, around this um, and, and has been for some decades now. I'm going to pass on to uh, Murillo. I don't want to talk too long. Um, but Murillo is also very, very significantly represented in the National Gallery's collection. His late self-portrait, probably about 1670, this is a very uh, significant and thoughtful and profound uh, rendition of, the, uh, of Murillo as uh, painter and designer. Uh, he makes it in accordance with the inscription down here um, as an ex voto for his children. And he's shown with his palette and brushes and with a drawing, possibly of a figure of... Uh, of, uh, of uh, St. John the Baptist uh, with his drawing implements down there. So these sort of two sides of the art of painting, which are the, the sort of speculative side, the drawing, the measuring, the thinking, uh, and then uh, the execution with uh, colours and uh, brushes. And it's no coincidence that these, um, these, these paintings are very close in date. Uh, on the left, of course, is the detail from uh, Las Meninas, where Velázquez presents himself in the mid-1650s, in the act of painting, but in fact, in the act of thinking about painting. He's about to place his brush on the palette. He's about to place the brush on the canvas, but he's, he's, he's an artist who's in the, that, that uh, thought process uh, that accompanies the physical execution. And I think these two paintings, uh, the National Gallery's painting of 1670, Las Meninas of the mid-1650s, these are amongst the most profound and uh, thoughtful uh, reflections on the activity of the artist, of the self-perception of the artist in uh, 17th century uh, Europe. Um, Murillo, of course, was uh, a civilian. He paints uh, all his career in Seville. He never leaves Spain. He's briefly in uh, Madrid, possibly more than once, um, and specializes in these very beautifully rendered genre subjects, which made him very famous in his own lifetime and famous uh, into the 18th century uh, as well. His works were very early kind of exported to the Netherlands, to Britain uh, as well. It was these sorts of pictures that were uh, admired. He was also a portrait painter. There's a very significant portrait by Murillo in the show here. This was a portrait of his close friend, uh, Justino de Neve, who was a canon of the cathedral 
and who supported him and promoted his work, leading to some of the most important uh, works in his uh, oeuvre. Uh, this is a National Gallery picture. It was acquired for the National Gallery in the early 1980s. Um, he was a canon of this cathedral, Seville Cathedral, a spectacular view of the cathedral from, uh, from, from up above. Um, and uh, this is the Giralda, this is the bishop's palace. So um, Justino de Neve's world, as it were, is uh, the world of the uh, cathedral, the chapter house over here where the canons of the cathedral uh, would meet then and still meet uh, today. And uh, up here the hospital of the uh, elderly priests and retired priests, uh, which um, Justino de Neve himself uh, founded. Uh, he was eventually to give to uh, the uh, Hospital de los Venerables uh, this picture here, which is also in the National Gallery. And this one too eventually was to go into that hospital, uh, which is the Immaculate Conception, uh, known as the Salt uh, Immaculate Conception, because the French Marshal uh, Soult removed it from Seville and took it to Paris. It was eventually returned to Spain in 1941 um, and is today known uh, rather by the name of the uh, Inmaculada de los Venerables on the basis of that, uh, that being the place it actually uh, came from. This comes from a, a remarkable exhibition that I was involved with when I was at the Prado where we were able to take this picture from the Prado collection, put it back in its original frame and in its original setting in uh, the Church of the Venerables Sacerdotes in uh, Seville. This is where Murillo takes the Immaculate Conception that we saw in that work from the late 1610s by uh, Velasquez. He does something very, very uh, remarkable with it and really makes the defining image uh, for uh, Catholic devotion right up to today, I suppose. Uh, and that's a view of the interior of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, of the Sala Capitular, of the chapter house of Seville Cathedral, uh, where you know, um, Justino de Neve would have sat. And it was thanks to Justino that uh, that Immaculate Conception by Murillo is uh, commissioned in the 1660s. But Murillo paints for lots of different organizations, foundations, brotherhoods in Seville. And this is one of his most famous pictures from a series he does uh, for the Hospital de la uh, Caridad, uh, which was a, and this still is actually, a um, brotherhood devoted to the service of the poor and particularly to uh, prisoners. So he makes this painting uh, as part of a suite. Uh, you can see there's a modern copy of the National Gallery picture um, representing the works of charity in the interior of the chapel. That's the view from outside. So these are amongst the most important works that were made in Seville by uh, Murillo and you could say very sadly in some ways, uh, were removed from the city. Um, I always remember when I visited Seville once and spoke at a conference on spoliation, um, I was asked by a, a journalist from the ABC, um, what did I think about this um, terrible spoliation that uh, Seville had experienced in the early 19th century uh, due to the French? And I said it was a terrible thing. It was like the removal of the soul of the city. Um, on the other hand, it also meant that, you know, civilian painting became known throughout the world and very distinguished Hispanists uh, emerged in uh, the rest of Europe and in America and so on. And the following morning, I appeared, a uh, little photograph of me in, uh, uh, in the Abbey with an arrow pointing down, not pointing up, uh, saying, um, Fenaldi approves of the spoliation of uh, Seville's uh, heritage. Um, not exactly what I said, but um, it is a very kind of significant topic, and it's still a topic which is sort of keenly felt uh, amongst uh, civilians today. But just one of those things is um, the influence of civilian painting on uh, British painters, for example. Uh, this work here belongs to Gainsborough. Gainsborough was a huge admirer of Murillo in the 18th century and paints works in the manner of or inspired by uh, Murillo. So it's that uh, uh, sort of cross-fertilization uh, works sort of leaving Spain and uh, becoming tremendously uh, important and significant for uh, painters across Europe. Uh, drawing to a close now, um, this is a, a, a fairly rare picture by Matho, who was uh, Velasquez's son-in-law, uh, who after the death of Velasquez becomes court painter, uh, first to Philip IV while he's still alive, and then subsequently to 
uh, Philip IV's widow, who becomes the regent of Spain, uh, Queen Mariana. And he paints this portrait of her in uh, Widow's Weeds in 1666. Um, a very interesting scene appearing here in the background where the young uh, Charles II, rather sickly child, the last of the, uh, of the um, Habsburg monarchs of, uh, of Spain, uh, is being given a, a glass of water by a menina here. Um, he, she's, he's accompanied by court uh, dwarfs uh, and by his chaperones over here. Uh, well, that is clearly taken from Velázquez's own uh, Las Meninas. So this is a picture that he would have known uh, very well. And it's a picture that inspired a whole series of uh, painters in, at the Madrid court from the 1660s onwards. Uh, Matthew, of course, was very close to Velázquez, must have seen him painting this picture. Uh, and when he does his portrait, his official portrait of Mariana, uh, wants to allude to this. Um, so there is this sort of constant uh, uh, referencing of works from an earlier age. This was one of the wonderful things about being at the Prado. Uh, you had this constant sense of artists kind of looking back and being constantly um, inspired by what they had seen. I'm not going to devote uh, much time to Ribera, but I couldn't uh, not leave him uh, in. Uh, a very important picture by this Valencian painter whose career is spent entirely uh, in uh, Italy, but whose works were sent back in very large numbers to Spain. And so he, too, was hugely influential and hugely admired in Spain. We recently discovered there was a document uh, in the Florentine archives, uh, which is an aviso, a sort of news item, uh, that said that uh, Ribera had been called to Spain by the king and was about to leave. We didn't know this until recently. Uh, he, 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 in the end, didn't go. But it's very interesting to see that the king was very aware of what he was doing in Naples, where he had settled, and wanted to bring him back to court. I'm just going to finish with three more images. Uh, this takes us back to 1995, and you can see that in that great exhibition we did on Spanish still life painting um, by Bill Jordan, sadly missed, great American uh, specialist in, uh, in Spanish painting uh, from Dallas, uh, died very recently, and a young uh, scholar called Peter Cherry collaborated on producing what was a superb exhibition on the subject of still life painting, uh, which had as its star item uh, your own uh, Sanchez Cotan. Um, I was the in-house curator for this show, and at the time the director was Neil McGregor, who you may have heard of. And I said, Neil, we can't call this exhibition Spanish Still Life from Velasquez to Goya. We need to call it Spanish Still Life from Sanchez Cotan to Goya. He said, nobody's ever heard of Sanchez Cotan. Um, so we, we'll, we'll call it from Velasquez to Goya. Well, he was the director, and that's what we did. But I was, uh, it was very clear that uh, when that exhibition was over, um, everyone had been hugely impressed by the works by Sanchez Cotan in the show, including this one. And I have no doubt that had we had that conversation just six months later, um, this exhibition would have had a different title. I think that was a significant contribution of the National Gallery to the study of Spanish art, as was this exhibition uh, some years ago about nine years ago, the sacred made real uh, Spanish painting and sculpture, which wanted to draw uh, to the public's attention and to scholars' attention the fascinating interplay uh, between uh, painters and sculptors in 17th century Spain, uh, who both work on this immensely impressive, expressionistic and naturalistic kind of rendition of these uh, religious subjects. But I could not finish by a small advert uh, for the show that the National Gallery has on at the moment. We've been talking about the golden age until now. Uh, we've been very conscious that that's where the great strength of the National Gallery's collection lies. But there are other bits of Spanish painting that are also quite important. And we were very fortunate in uh, 1998 to be able to acquire this work for the National Gallery's collection, Bartolomé Bermejo's uh, St. Michael, dating from uh, 14, about 1470. <coughs> Um, which is now the centerpiece of an exhibition uh, devoted to, uh, to the artist. And anyone coming to London in the next three months will be able to see, see a jewel of an exhibition devoted to uh, Bartolomé Bermejo, uh, Spanish master painter of the Renaissance. And I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.
this was wonderful, and you will enjoy the galleries, believe me. But we have a little time left for questions and answers. If somebody is, has a question, please wait until the microphone is with you. <coughs> Did you turn it on? Wow, thank you. That was, can you hear me? Yes. yes thank yes. you so much. That was incredible. Uh, what a treat. And uh, one of the points you made is a role that exhibitions have in making us see sure. artists or making us see um, ideas anew. And I was interested in your thoughts about the story that you were telling us is one where the golden age of Spain is a very peninsular golden age. It's about Spain and Mediterranean with um, El Greco. And one of the uh, ideas that this exhibition has is that the golden age of Spain is uh, much more global and that is not uh, exclusively about Iberia, but is a uh, transatlantic and transpacific one where the Americas are part of it. Uh, so there's sort of uh, different ideas about what is golden and who is Spain. And I just wanted to hear what you reflected on that. Um, I, I think that's very eloquently put, and uh, I think, generally speaking, the sort of uh, academic research moves ahead of the collections. Um, ours is a traditional collection formed basically in the late 19th century, um, early 20th century, when there was a certain concept of uh, the Spanish school, rather old-fashioned, I suppose. Um, also, the National Gallery has always uh, sought to represent uh, at the very highest level of quality. Now, I know that that's a loaded term in its own, uh, 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 in its own right, um, but mm -hmm. the intention was to allow the visitor who comes to the National Gallery to sort of travel, uh, as it were, along the peaks of uh, European painting. Uh, I think you're absolutely right to point out, and that's exactly what your uh, exhibition here does, that the, um, the, 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 the concept of um, an Iberian golden age is, uh, I think, still effective, uh, but I think needs to be seen in a much wider uh, context. And I think that is in line with um, you know, recent thinking about uh, history, about empire, about colonies, about how uh, ideas are transmitted and transposed and transformed, uh, the way in which um, uh, you know, cultural artifacts are reinterpreted and um, and represented and given new meanings. And I think that's one of the very fascinating things about the, uh, the exhibition. Uh, you've taken the uh, Golden Age concept and you've opened it up uh, to a much, much broader uh, idea. And I think that's, uh, that's what all of us are uh, learning from and enjoying in the show. Good morning. Uh, my name is Cecile Alessi. I'm a historic guide interpreter at Hearst Castle, San Simeon State Historical Monument. Uh, one painter that's not being mentioned, and, and we, uh, I'm just a guide, but um, our museum director did loan uh, the Virgin of the Pillar appearing to uh, Santiago de Compostela. And there's two Coellos here today. Um, I've never seen two in the same exhibit. I grew up in El Escorial, and I've my personal observation is that Coelho would have perhaps been more recognized for his talent had he had perhaps a client who was more attractive. The last king, Carlos, of course, was not a good client. His children all, or he couldn't uh, create children, and he, uh, his wives left him, and perhaps that's why Coelho's uh, art isn't getting the respect, and also that his greatest work of art, in my opinion, and I don't know about yours, is hidden in the sacristy and only shown one day out of the year. And so I'm just wondering, since all these folks are going to see the two Coelhos in a little bit, what you might remark on his talent. I, I think you've done the PR for Coelho extremely well there, actually. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> he, he, is a very, he is a very great artist. Um, I think it's, um, it's unfortunate, as you say, that his great masterpiece, which is the, um, is the, um, the, 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 the great altarpiece in the Escorial Sacristy of uh, Charles II uh, kneeling before the, um, the Blessed Sacrament, uh, is simply not visible. It is an absolutely, it's an absolute masterpiece. It, it, it's of the kind of rank of Las Meninas, uh, but it's simply not seen. It's a very, very important picture. It's very significant for uh, the period. It's very significant for 
uh, the monarchy's view of itself. It's very significant for the relationship between church and state in 17th century Spain, and it's a very, very finely painted um, picture. Um, uh, frankly, I think some artists are just a little bit unfortunate uh, at times, you know, the, the, the times they lived or the opportunities they have or uh, how widely their pictures get uh, seen. Uh, but I think it's an exhibition like this which introduces, I mean, most people will know something about El Greco, something about Velasquez, something about Murillo, but it's exhibitions like, the, like these which um, enable um, sort of new territories to be kind of new horizons to be opened up uh, for the public, and I think, you know, with the two pictures by Coelho in the show, um, will alert visitors um, to the show that when they go on to other museums, when they go to the Prado, when they go to uh, Budapest, or when they go to um, other American collections that have Coelho's in them, there's not that many of them, actually. Um, he's an artist that one can, uh, one, can, one can work up a lot of enthusiasm for.